a pieces of some pieces of information on how this panel will work. So first of all, I guess you all received the information from the organization about this. You are going to have, and this is information for the presenters, you are going to have 15 minutes, 15 minutes to give your presentation, okay? Let's try to stick to time so that everyone uh, has time uh, to give uh, the presentation and uh, get comments and questions at the end as well. Um, after everyone gives uh, the presentations, I will just give some brief comments and ask some questions about the presentations to stir up the debate as well. And after all the panelists address also the comments I gave, we can open the floor at the end of the sessions, the session for comments and questions also from uh, the audience. Um, the organization asked me to finish our session a little bit before 11. We are starting with the delay. So uh, the plan was to end at 10.50, 10 minutes before the end of the session. So I guess we can try to end the session at uh, 10.55, so five minutes before 11, if everything goes okay. Um, so before we start with our presentations, just one last piece of information, and this is a classic in Zoom sessions as well. Um, I will ask everyone to have their microphones switched off unless you are giving a presentation or when uh, we open the questions uh, to, the, to the audience and you pose your question. Apart from that, I will ask you to have uh, your microphone switched off so that there are no disturbances while the speaker is talking, okay? So I guess we are in conditions to start now. Um, following the order in the program, the first one will be Onel to give his presentation. So Onel, when you are ready, please go ahead, 15 minutes. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Uh, good morning. Uh, I have a PowerPoint presentation and I should share the screen right now. I guess you can share. Perfect. So can you see my presentation? Uh, yes. Okay, thank you. Good morning, esteemed uh, hosts and distinguished panelists. My name is David Donnell, and I'm a PhD student in the second year of studies at the National University of Political Studies and Public Administration uh, in Bucharest, Romania. Today, I'm going to present you a paper entitled Balancing in Central Asia, Russia-China Relations at Regional Level in Realist Perspective. Um, the topic of this paper uh, started from observing the complexity of the Russia-China relations, uh, which presented both instances of cooperation and competition throughout the years. And uh, Central Asia became one of the arenas in which their relations took place after 1991. Uh, so, in this context, the aim of the paper is to analyze the Russia-China relations at the level of Central Asia during the 2001-2019 period from a realist perspective. In this regard, the research questions that I intend to use are, are uh, how can the relations between Russia and China be explained at the level of Central Asia in the 2001-2019 period? And what are the factors which prompted the relations between Russia and China in every state during the 2001-2019 period? More precisely, the paper um, identifies several factors which it considers to make competition or cooperation more present in the relations between Russia and China at the level of Central Asia throughout the studied period. Thus, uh, I am able to identify uh, three different stages in the relations between the two states at regional level, based on these uh, factors which trigger either competition, either cooperation. Firstly, I will start with a bit of uh, theoretical insights, but I won't insist too much on them. I would like just to point that the paper uses the balance of power theory and in this regard, I would like to highlight the contribution brought by uh, Hans Morgenthau, who developed the balance of power theory as a mechanism working in a system of autonomous units, uh, a mechanism which can appear naturally in this kind of system and which preserves a balance between them. 
uh, Kenneth Wells further developed the balance of power theory, but from a different point of view, focusing on uh, systemic factors. So stressing the role of the system level in the relations between the states. And uh, he advised, uh, or better said, uh, in his opinion, uh, the states should not pursue maximum power because uh, if they become hegemon, they will attract the formation of an opposing coalition against them, uh, which would be detrimental to their interest. In this regard, his position is observed as um, defensive realism. Uh, further, this theory was developed by John Mearsheimer, who stressed the fact that states, in fact, should uh, maximize their power in order to gain security. So, uh, this, his position came to be regarded as offensive realism. I'd like to point another uh, interesting theoretical aspect of uh, John Mearsheimer's theoretical perspective. He perceived the concept of power as another instance of the balance of power in a sort of co hegemony uh, approach as um, a context in which both minor powers and great powers take part. And uh, there is a competition between uh, the powers engaged in this process, but at the same time, there is also a certain degree of cooperation between them as they preserve the balance of power in a concert of power approach. Uh, furthermore, in uh, regarding the theoretical aspects, I'd like to highlight that this paper focuses on three dimensions of power. Uh, of course, the military power, which is the main uh, theoretical approach towards power in realism is included, but there is also uh, focus on political influence, uh, which I perceive in this regard in the purpose of this paper as political cooperation with the states in the region and economic power translated as trade with the region or economic presence in the region. Uh, regarding the methodological aspects of the paper, uh, it focuses on quantitative and qualitative methodological approaches through data analysis in comparative approach and document analysis. The study period uh, spans between 2001 to 2019. I chose 2001 because of the implications given by the 9-11 terrorist attacks upon the international system and upon Central Asia through the China relations at uh, regional level in Central Asia. 2019 was chosen, of course, because of the relative stability of the political and economical environment compared to 2020. Um, talking a bit about the regional context of the analysis, I focus on Central Asia, which I perceive for the purpose of the study as being composed of Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, and Uzbekistan. The place was uh, a scene for great power competition in the 19th century between Tsarist Russia and Great Britain in what some scholars describe as the great game. Uh, the competition of the two powers for colonial possessions and territory in the region. Um, after the end of the 19th century, Russia imposed its dominance on the region up until the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991. Um, during the 90s, the region was mostly neglected by the international community, but it came back to the focus of the international scene in uh, 2001 after the 9-11 terrorist attacks. When, as I said earlier, the US involved in the region uh, in order to conduct the operations in Afghanistan. Uh, among the great powers involved in the region after 2001 are the US, Russia, and China, but among all, Russia and China are the most influent. Now, regarding uh, Russia and China, the two have um, more connections, let's say, with the region. Regarding Russia, it developed historical ties with the region um, during the decades of Tsarist and then Soviet rule. Um, after 1991, it still preserved a high profile in the security domain through its military presence, which was still in the region. Um, among its interests, uh, which I identified, there are uh, the access and um, the control over the exports of energy resources, uh, the maintenance of 
regional security and the repression of any form of radical movements, especially those regarding Islam radical movements, and upholding political influence upon the regimes. Concerning China, uh, it was interested in regional stability during the 90s, but this aspect was mostly ensured by still the presence of Russia in the region. Um, beginning with the 21st century, so after 2001, uh, especially Beijing started to develop its own interests in the region. Uh, more precisely, it was interested in diversifying its energy resources in order to avoid falling in dependence on Russia. Uh, but also, uh, China is interested in maintaining regional stability and also enhancing development in order to ease or to reduce the tendencies of uh, uh, separatism from Xinjiang. So after a brief analysis upon the interests of the two powers, uh, it can be argued that the two states, Russia and China, they share a similar interest for maintaining regional stability, which may be a potential factor for cooperation between the two states. At the same time, they share an equal interest in the regional energy resources, thus meaning they both try to access them, which brings prospects of competition. Starting from these uh, arguments, I identified three uh, stages in the relations of the two states in Central Asia, uh, which should not be regarded as presenting a exclusive type of relation, but mostly the most dominant type of relation between the two at a certain period. And also the temporal delimitation should be regarded as blurry. So the first stage uh, in this regard is taking place from 2001 and 2005 when Russia and China cooperated against the US. So we can uh, see the strong involvement of the US in Central Asia after the 9-11 terrorist attacks, especially in, uh, towards Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan, the K-2 air base from Uzbekistan and the Manas air base in Kyrgyzstan, representing uh, very important, uh, from a strategic point of view, aspects for uh, the operations the US was about to conduct in Afghanistan. Uh, soon, Russia and China felt threatened by the U.S. presence in the region from multiple points of view. On the one side, because of what they perceived as a military encirclement, but on the other side, also because of possible destabilizing effects uh, on the regimes in the region, because of democracy promotion, norms promotion by the Western powers, including the U.S. And uh, all these fears were taking place also on the background of the color revolutions which started to appear in during the next years. Thus, uh, I argue that the US presence uh, determined Russia and China to cooperate in the political and military spheres at the level of the region in this period, 2001, 2005. Uh, cooperation which took place uh, in military dimension through joint exercise in the joint exercises in the arms trade, but also in political dimension through issuing uh, common statements, common declarations uh, in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, in this regard, triggering the US presence in the region or the US supremacy. And a special case is represented by Uzbekistan. Uh, both Russia and China supported Tashkent in, against the US and Western criticism uh, in the context of the Andijan events in 2005. And in this regard, uh, both Russia and China backed the decision of Uzbekistan to evict the US from the K2 air base. Um, after the eviction from the K2 air base, the position of the US uh, diminished in the region and uh, even though it was still present it made room for uh, another dimension of the relations between Russia and China to take the front seat and between 2005-2010 competition became more present in the relations of the two states. As I said both have interest in accessing the energy resources and since the uh, resources are limited this brings prospects of competition. In these dynamics, Russia started with a better position because of the legacy of, uh, of which uh, it inherited from the Soviet Union, uh, meaning infrastructure, uh, links of all kinds, political, cultural, etc. 
In this regard, by 2007, Gazprom had monopoly over the gas supplies from Central, from Central Asia. Uh, on the other side, China uh, managed to score an important uh, action in 2005-2006 when it bought Petro Kazakhstan uh, in an action in which it did more than Lukoil. And um, it also opened the Sino Kazakh pipeline in 2006. Uh, the case of Turkmenistan is another special factor in the energy dynamics in the region since. Uh, China intervened in 2009 in, a, in the middle of a Turkmen-Russian gas war by offering a 4 billion loan uh, to Turkmenistan, thus breaking the Russian monopoly over the gas exports of Central Asia. This action also was accompanied by um, the opening of the Central Asia-China pipeline, which became operational in 2009. Thus bringing more and more uh, resources towards China. Over the years, it developed and expanded. So in this regard, I argue that during 2005, 2010, China challenged Russia's position in the energy field and brought the overall balance of power in the energy domain uh, to an equilibrium, if not even if tilted it towards itself at the level of Central Asia. This graph uh, shows the uh, trade of uh, fuel between Kazakhstan and Russia and China. It's challenging to find this type of data for all the Central Asian states, so I focus only on Kazakhstan in this regard. But I think it shows how China's position uh, improved after 2005 uh, compared to Russia's position regarding the fossil fuel trade. Finally, the last uh, the last uh, period identified uh, is taking place from 2010 towards 2019 when the competition between the two states is elevated, is diminished, because um, after, the, after the economic crisis of 2008-2009, China improved its economic position in the region. It developed its economic ties through trade and uh, trade of goods and of course, of energy resources, but also through connectivity in the framework of the Belt, of the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, so if before 2008, 2009, Russia was the main trading partner of Central Asia, after that, China became the main trading partner of uh, Central Asia. Russia could not oppose uh, the economic power of China in this regard, but it maintained its dominant position in the regional security field through multiple agreements, both on multilateral level and bilateral level with the states of Central Asia. And uh, regarding the main um, regional projects of the two states, it can be argued that they have also prospects of coordination, precisely the Regional Economic Union and the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, this dynamic or this way of uh, the two states States relationing at the level of Central Asia was described but by one of the authors that I studied as a division of labor, which suggests the coordination of the two states in different fields of action, preserving at the same time the overall balance of power. Finally, the conclusions or the findings of the paper are those that it can be uh, identified the first period during 2001-2005 when Russia and China cooperated in a balancing act against the US uh, against the U.S. presence in the region. Cooperation which can be regarded in a uh, world's defensive realism approach since the two states tried to preserve their positions in the region. In the second period, 2005-2010, show shows a competition between Russia and China for natural resources. So there is now a balance of power taking place between the two states in the energy field, a uh, balance of power which was challenged by Russia, by China, excuse me, uh, who acted against uh, Russia in the energy domain by uh, gaining more contracts and more access to the energy resources. Thus, it can be perceived as an offensive realism uh, approach in Mirsheimer's perspective. Finally, the third period, when Russia and China eased their tensions on the competition and they engaged in a concert of power or a coordinated balancing, as Mirsheimer described in his article, which shows uh, a mild competition still existing within the two states, as well as a certain degree of cooperation. Thank you for listening, and I'm looking forward to your questions and feedback.
Thank you a lot, David. Um, if you could just exactly, thank you. Um, so I just got the information that the next speaker is not joining us. So uh, we can move to the third presentation in the program, Tian Liu. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, so you can start when you're ready. Try to stick to the 15 minutes, okay? And if you want to share your PowerPoint, you can also do it. Okay, thank you. And before you start, let me just give an, again the, another piece of information. Please try to keep your microphone switched off, okay? So that the speaker has no disturbances. If you don't have your microphone switched off, please switch it off, okay? Tiani, you can start. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Tian Yi Liu. Today, my topic is the geographical view of the European Union and the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative. The Belt and the Road is an international initiative proposed proposed by China that takes the interconnection of countries along the route as the means of initiative takes the free and harmonious development of all countries as the initiative goal and takes policy communication on uh, impeded treat people to people bonds as initiative content. It also expands Asia, Africa, and uh, Europe. An international grand initiative on three continents involving more than 60 countries and uh, more than 4 billion people. Since the Belt and Road Initiative was put forward and put into practice, the Belt and Road Initiative has gradually transformed from plan to practice and increasingly become the focus of the research by think tank and the scholars. Hey, you're one Belt, One Road has given the Euro Asia continent a new geostrategy perspective of harmonious cooperation. As the society entered in the 21st century of economic globalization, the world uh, has undergone many changes. The development of trade and investment liberalization has broken the traditional sea land boundary and the geopolitical division and has made the whole world interconnected and interdependent. China's One Belt, One Road has transformed the traditional geopolitical concept that emphasizes sea power and land power into a new geopolitical concept that realize the interest of all countries through mutual cooperation. From the perspective of China, whether the Belt and Road can be successfully promoted, the subjective and the objective factors of member states should be fully considered on the issue of Belt and Road cooperation risk management. Central and Eastern European countries are located in the Balkans and regarded as problem-prone areas. On the whole, the potential problems and challenges facing um, uh, challenges uh, facing China and the European Union's relations are still caused by collision with China Europeans' role and their roles in the world. In theory, the logic of geopolitics and is the game and the competition between big countries, where geoeconomics reflect the close connection between politics, state power, and the economy. With the develop, um, development of economic globalization, we are now in the area of geopolitics and the economy. The joint action of integrated Europe and the European Union will definitely affect the implementation of the Belt and the Road. 
Moreover, the European Union's influence in global geopolitics is an important international organization that cannot be ignored in any regional and international cooperation. The geopolitical confrontation between China and the United States behind the economic problems is also a foreseeable geopolitical risk. Therefore, China hopes to strengthen the European Union's understanding of China's Belt and Road Initiative. It plays the role of traditional links between the European Union and the United States and enables the European Union to change its prejudice toward China's Belt and Road Initiative in terms of position and um, understanding importance. The two major powers in the European Union, Germany and France, have exceeded the provision of the Euro Stabilization Treaty. National debt shall not uh, exceed 3% of GDP. Since the outbreak of the international financial crisis, especially the European debt crisis, the European economy has suffered setbacks. China's one built, one wrote can coincide with Europe's junk plan, junker plan. Italian Prime Minister Giuseppe Conte also stated on March 8, 2019, that this will be an opportunity for our country. He revealed that the document to be signed by Italy and China is not only a statement of intent and that it will be by immediately. Conte emphasized that Italy is expected to win Chinese investment for the seaports of Genoa and Toronto. The Italian Prime Minister also believes that for the European Union, this cooperation between Italy and China is also expected to important European high standard of financial transparency, rule of law and the environment into the Belt and the Road. The reason why the China-European Union Memorandum of Understanding can quickly reach a consensus because the world is, uh, free, uh, is in a phase of change and the European Union is also constantly changing. On the one hand, the European Union needs to adapt to the rapid rise of China and the impact of the Belt and Road project in Europe. On the other hand, it also seeks cooperation with China, hoping to introduce Chinese investment. In recent years, China's investment in Europe is very uh, small um, uh, in pro proportion, but has grown rapidly. China's um, investment in Europe has huge growth potential and the European Union's huge demand for funds is an important foundation for China's Belt and Road cooperation with the European Union. Infrastructure interconnection is a priority area in the construction of the Belt and Road. Investment and trade cooperation as main cooperation method for the construction of the Belt and Road in Europe. According to agreement of 2030 transport system takes the pan-European Union transport network connecting the belt and the road and the junker plan is conductive to the formation of three major international economic cooperation corridors. The new Asia to European land bridge, China to Mongolia to Russia and China to Central Asia, West Asia. Improving the overall infrastructure connectivity and business operations in the regional environment. The Belt and Road Initiative is an opportunity for the European Union to enhance its global influence. The Belt and the Road is a green, environmentally friendly, and sustainable road and is carried out in accordance with market and oriented operations and international standards. China to Europe and the European cooperation in the development and the operation of third party markets.
Geopolitical theory believes that geopolitical factors such as maritime communication lines and strategy location have important influence on national interests and national strategies. It reflects the basic characteristic of power games based on geographic spatial situation. Since the 1990s, globalization has shown um, a trend of in-depth development. The political communication, economic and trade exchanges, and even cultural exchanges between countries have reached unprecedented heights. From the perspective of geopolitics, the geopolitical space carried by the Belt and Road Initiative includes the center and the periphery of the Euro-Asia continents, the sea passages of the Pacific and Atlantic. These areas are classic geopolitical zones that are very sensitive to countries in the world. The Belt and Road Initiative is an international grand strategy involving politics, economic, and culture. The construction of the Belt and Road will inevitably affect the change and exceeding geopolitical structure. The accession of Italy, a majority member of the European Union, has made Italy the end of the Belt and Road Maritime Silk Road in March 2019, which is conducted to the connection of the European continent. Italy is an important hub of the ancient Silk Road in history. Europe has experience in regional peace and cooperation, but some European countries are skeptical of China's lead one built one road. In addition, certain countries or regions will become the drawing point of the Belt and Road Initiative. This kind of geopolitical changes will cause geopolitical games in the countries along the route, which will bring new disturbances to the Belt and Road Initiative. China's domestic underestimation of uh, Europe's uncertainty and uh, Europe's overestimation of China's geopolitical intentions is um, worth nothing as China continues to become a global power. China and the European Union are located in the east and west ends of Euro-Asia. Although there is no direct geographic connection, the European Union's perception of the Belt and Road is not only a continuation of the perception of the rights of China, but also a new area of this issue development and change. Conversely, China's re-understanding of the European Union's cognition is not only the basis and the guarantee for China's implementation of the Belt and Road, but also an important theoretical basis for China to develop Sino-European Un Euro Euro Union relations and the framework for the Belt and Road. The European Union will strengthen the European Union's cooperation with China to meet common responsibilities across all three pillars of the United Nations, human rights, peace and security, and development. The European Union has its own institutions, and the European Union members have exclusive power to develop their influence on the premise of mutual respect in multilateral relations. Germany is the first European country to support the Belt and Road Initiative. The Belt and Road Initiative is connecting with the European Union's junk plan and the pan-European Union's transportation network. So, the cooperation between China and the European Union through the Belt and Road Initiative can increase mutual understanding and reduce the European Union's doubts about the Belt and Road related uh, projects. The Belt and Road project have a large investment and faces many medium and long-term risks. 
three relevant European Union institutions and companies have reached in experience with risk assessment and governance. Cooperation between the Belt and the Road Initiative and the, the European Union can bring benefits to both sides and increase geographic connections. Based on the principle of equality and mutual benefits, the Belt, uh, One Belt, One Road welcome European Union countries to join in the construction of the One Belt, One Road and bring benefits to the participating countries through the Belt, uh, One Belt and One Road initiative. Generally speaking, China's One Belt, One Road is for the European Union. The One Belt, One Road cannot only amplify the achievement of European Union integration. It also makes up for the shortcoming of European Union integration and eliminated the contradictions between the East and the North of Europe, also explore the beauty of our small countries. Thank you very much. Thank you a lot, Tianyi. Thank you for your presentation. And thanks also for sticking to time. Thank you very much. Um, okay, with our second presentation, we can move to our third and last presentation of uh, this panel. Um, I'll ask Andrei Kinyakin to give his presentation. Thank you very much. 15 minutes. You can start when you are ready. Thank you so much uh, for providing me some uh, time and your attention just to share my actually uh, the original processes within the Eurasian continent and uh, the from my perspective very interesting um, regional integration blocks or regional ideas initiatives uh, which um, uh, from my perspective have some um, have some potential, but uh, at the moment there are also certain uh, factors, deterrents uh, for the fulfillment of this um, uh, fulfillment of this uh, regional integration initiati initiatives. Well, um, topic is uh, partnership assessing the integration potential of meta regional. Uh, I must stress that uh, at the moment uh, I'm working on this paper. That's why. Some um, uh, some uh, thesis, some um, keywords of the, this uh, presentation are at the moment uh, elaborated, and uh, later on I can also make uh, the full paper concerning this topic. So, uh, if we take uh, the Eurasia and um, Eurasian integration for uh, not only uh, Russians but for many uh, also the Western uh, scholars, uh, one of the major point uh, in this respect is uh, so-called uh, Eurasianism or Eurasian uh, school. This is actually uh, the um, uh, club of philosophers, uh, uh, the former um, refugee from the Russian Empire. Uh, which uh, were um, elaborating some ideas concerning uh, Eurasia as uh, uh, something like heartland. Uh, if we uh, come to the uh, classical uh, uh, notions of uh, geopolitics. So here's uh, 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 one of the citation of uh, um, very influential one, Pero Savitsky, who uh, stress uh, the idea is not only uh, Eurasian in uh, uh, um, so-called uh, North Eurasia, uh, which uh, at the moment is um, corresponds uh, with uh, the former Soviet Republic. But he also tried to elaborate the idea of so-called Eurasia Centre Leitore. This is actually the white Eurasia which encompassed not only uh, the so-called former uh, Soviet space but uh, other regions. At the moment, uh, if we take uh, the concept of Greater Eurasia, uh, this is the uh, philosophical and I would say uh, the concept of uh, in international relations which is uh, rather actively liberated uh, in Russia and other post-Soviet republics, 
um, uh, greater Eurasia encompass uh, uh, several regions. As you see, this is not only uh, Europe and Eurasia uh, uh, as a whole, but also South uh, Asia, Middle East, uh, West Asia, all of them uh, are regarded as part of this greater Eurasia. And uh, this concept uh, 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 is uh, rather promising for, uh, for uh, the current integration processes uh, within the Eurasian continent and post-Soviet uh, space. I mean, first of all, uh, the activity of uh, Eurasian Economic Union and also gives some insights uh, for uh, the question of connectivity between Eurasian Economic Union and other regional uh, integration initiatives and uh, blocks. Uh, first of all, uh, it is uh, mentioned by the previous uh, Previous speaker, uh, Belt and Road Initiative, because uh, uh, actually uh, Eurasian Economic Union and Belt and Road Initiative at the moment uh, 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 really uh, made uh, by leaders of uh, Russia and China uh, to uh, find uh, common grounds and to provide some connectivity. But, uh, if we take uh, actually the uh, essence of this idea of Greater Eurasia, I um, singled out some uh, so-called micro-trends. Uh, uh, this prerequisites why actually this uh, concept emerged. Uh, it emerged uh, about seven, eight years ago, probably 10 years ago uh, in Russia. And it is uh, connected, first of all, with the demise of, of other concept. First of all, uh, the concept of greater Europe, uh, which was elaborated uh, from the beginning on 2000, uh, year 2000, and the emergence uh, of uh, non-Western powers and non-Western uh, concepts in, uh, for instance, China and so on. Uh, so, uh, this is actually um, uh, micro trends. This is also uh, uh, micro trends. Uh, if we take uh, uh, the concept of uh, Greater Eurasia as a uh, concept, uh, this is uh, also the situation uh, concerning uh, the um, regional risks which emerged actually in 2014. I mean, uh, the situation in Ukraine. Um, uh, for Russia, it plays a uh, really uh, important role, but it also uh, the um, situation in other regions of the world, for instance, uh, Syria is also regarded as uh, the situation then, uh, which actually, uh, which actually uh, stipulated uh, the emergence of the new uh, philosophical concepts and uh, new concepts of international relations. Uh, so, what is actually um, a greater uh, or extensive uh, Eurasian partnership? Uh, this is not a uh, actually a, um, concept, uh, but this is uh, the project, uh, the uh, pragmatic uh, initiative, which was put forward uh, by Russian President Vladimir Putin. Uh, and uh, the essence of this idea is uh, to provide uh, the economic uh, cooperation, first of all, between different uh, integration blocks and different uh, regionalism, uh, regionalism uh, within uh, the Eurasian continent. So I must stress here two points. First of all, that the prime uh, goal of this greater or extensive Eurasian partnership is uh, to facilitate uh, the creation of so-called integration of integrations. This is actually um, connectivity between different uh, integration blocks and different uh, integration uh, uh, integration structures. And second, uh, and this is one of the major topic of my presentation, that Greater Eurasian Partnership turns out to be the new form of regionalism, uh, which I uh, uh, regard as meta-regionalism. Uh, uh, if we take uh, the situation with uh, meta-regionalism, because this is uh, something like a theoretical uh, framework, uh, just uh, uh, to make you aware about this idea, if we take um, uh, if we take uh, the uh, current uh, forms of regionalism, uh, some um, some distinguished uh, scholars like uh, uh, Philippe de Lombard or uh, Michael Tello single out uh, several types of uh, um, uh, regional organizations or regionalism. This is uh, micro regionalism, sub regional integration structure. 
I used uh, the names of uh, integration structures uh, which are active within the post Soviet space. Uh, the Baltic Assembly, uh, actually, uh, the organization which encompass three Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. If you take uh, the Guam organization, this is Georgia, Ukraine, uh, uh, Georgia, uh, Ukraine, uh, Moldova, and, um, um, and Azerbaijan. So, uh, mesoregionalism, this is regional integration structure, and uh, uh, for the post Soviet space, it's valid uh, for uh, the Eurasian Economic Union, which at the moment encompasses uh, five former uh, Soviet republics Russia, Belarus, uh, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, uh, and, uh, <clears throat> and Armenia. But it's also valid for uh, the uh, European Union because uh, uh, European Union, uh, as an integration structure, is uh, actually. Um, special within the boundaries of the European region. So uh, macro-regionalism, uh, here's the situation that Commonwealth of Independent States, which uh, uh, encompass the uh, post-Soviet republics, but at the same time, uh, it uh, uh, can be regarded as uh, uh, inter-regional um, regional organization. And uh, also meta-regionalism in, uh, in this respect is uh, something like trans-regional integration structure. Uh, which uh, or provides actually the connectivity between different integration structures. And, and uh, I will show you uh, what integration structures are deemed to be the part of this uh, greater Eurasian partnership. But uh, one more point uh, concerning meta regionalism uh, the main features from my perspective is uh, first of all, integration uh, or trans regional character. At the moment, uh, the great in the interregional uh, cooperation, it means actually uh, providing some cooperation between different uh, uh, regional uh, integration blocks within the Eurasian continent. Uh, uh, if we take Eurasian continent uh, here, uh, we must uh, uh, take this concept of greater Eurasia. It means actually not only uh, connectivity between uh, former post-Soviet republics or uh, Eurasian Economic Union and China, but also uh, integration structures which are active, for instance, uh, in uh, South Asia like ASEAN and so on. Uh, the loose inter inter interrelation between the major actors. So uh, the um, basis for this interaction is uh, the interrelation based of uh, this formal of FTA plus. So uh, no binding agreements and no uh, movement towards uh, actually uh, the classic uh, integration blocks like this um, Belo Balasa structure and something like this. Uh, the third one, facilitation of uh, integration of integrations. Uh, and I, I have already mentioned this and uh, Fourth, last but not least, uh, the main focus not only um, on economic issues, but also on security cooperation. Uh, and here uh, we go to this, uh, just, I'm, uh, sorry. Just uh, to show you actually how it goes uh, with, uh, with uh, the current uh, design of this uh, uh, Greater Eurasian Partnership. So uh, the assembling point uh, is uh, deemed uh, Eurasian Economic Union. Um, this uh, um, project uh, of uh, Greater Eurasian Partnership was put forward by Russia and uh, um, actually uh, in that, uh, heavily promoted by Russia. But um, at the moment, there are uh, some interrelations uh, between Eurasian Economic Union and Belt and Road Initiative. And uh, this uh, interrelations are initialized uh, on um, not only on uh, um, bilateral ground, so between Russia and China, because Eurasian Economic Union is percepted uh, in the West as uh, uh, Russian, -le uh, Russia led and uh, with their strong Russian dominance. But there is also a multilateral um, institutionalization <clears throat> between Eurasian Economic Union and Belt and Road Initiative. So uh, there is also some activity between uh, Eurasian Economic Union and Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Uh, I must take into account uh, uh, one point that from 2017, uh, uh, the Shanghai uh, Cooperation Organization encompassed also such uh, 
countries like Pakistan and India. This is uh, rather interesting. Uh, but also, uh, Eurasian Economic Union uh, tries to uh, promote this idea toward uh, the uh, South Asian uh, nations. And uh, in 2017, 2018, there were some contacts uh, between uh, Eurasian Economic Union uh, and uh, ASEAN. And uh, in uh, October 2019, uh, uh, the uh, free trade area between uh, Eurasian Economic Union and Singapore was established. This is actually uh, one of the points uh, why at the moment uh, Eurasian Economic Union is um, uh, deemed as uh, the assembling point of this great Eurasian partnership. But I'm uh, coming back home just uh, to show you actually the, the timeline of this so from idea uh, to uh, actually uh, the current uh, situation, uh, what is going on, I must say uh, that, uh, of course, uh, the situation with uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, heavily influenced uh, the uh, elaboration of this project. But uh, in October 2019, uh, the agreement between uh, the Eurasian Economic Union and China on co uh, economic cooperation uh, came into force. And uh, one of the major points is actually uh, the uh, active uh, cooperation uh, to uh, promote this idea of a greater Eurasian partnership. Um, as I told you that uh, assembly point is uh, Eurasian Economic Union, but there are different tracks uh, for uh, the creation of this greater Eurasian partnership. And at the moment, uh, this is uh, really uh, interesting due to the fact that um, many um, things, many projects uh, um, are carried out on the uh, national level, but not only a supranational level. Notwithstanding, uh, there's a situation uh, when uh, we can, uh, we can um, discuss national, supranational uh, track as probably a basic one, uh, and national and supranational as uh, possible uh, ways of uh, create, uh, creating this uh, greater Eurasian partnership. At the moment, the basic one is uh, uh, the second one, uh, but uh, who knows, uh, probably uh, uh, if this project uh, um, This, if this project actually proves its uh, feasibility, probably there will be no, uh, another way of assembling this, uh, assembling this uh, structure. So uh, this is uh, how it, uh, actually uh, Eurasia Eurasia partnership uh, um, is deemed by the leaders of different nations. I must uh, tell you that, uh, of course, uh, what the European Union concerns, uh, this is, uh, actually uh, really, uh, really hard issue to discuss uh, the cooperation between, um, uh, for instance, the Eurasian Economic Union and European Union. And what uh, the Great Eurasian Partnership concern, I think it is uh, uh, really uh, not uh, at the current uh, situation to the fact that uh, there is a situation of uh, non-recognition between uh, Euro European Union and Eurasian Economic Union. And, and as I told you, Eurasian Economic Union is deemed as assembling point for this uh, Great Eurasian Partnership. Notwithstanding, uh, the designers of this Great Eurasian Partnership uh, regard uh, this project uh, as uh, the connectivity between a major, uh, major um, uh, integration blocks, but also uh, uh, probably the major uh, uh, um, counterpart at the moment to cooperate is, of course, uh, China. And it was stressed by Vladimir Putin, who is actually the architect of this uh, Great Eurasian Partnership. And uh, as I uh, have already um, told you and uh, have already shown you uh, this timeline, uh, at the moment, the um, interrelation between uh, Eurasian Economic Union and Belt and Road uh, are initialized and uh, there is something like uh, uh, integration initiatives uh, to not to be competitors but uh, to be uh, rather partners uh, um, uh, in Eurasian continent. So um, this is 
uh, also one of, of the figures just to show you actually uh, how uh, the Euro Euro uh, Great Eurasian Partnership uh, um, can be designed uh, with the current uh, integration initiatives. I mean, first of all, uh, Belt and Road Initiative, uh, which is uh, here also shown. And uh, probably uh, a couple of minutes uh, just uh, to uh, share my vision uh, about the uh, um, chances of uh, Great Eurasian Partnership to become uh, not only the idea, but also the feasible um, uh, project. Here I show you the SWOT analysis uh, I uh, made uh, and uh, probably if we take uh, uh, the strengths and weaknesses, uh, uh, well, uh, the weaknesses of this project are rather abundant uh, and uh, the strengths are not so uh, actually uh, obvious as uh, probably with the other uh, projects in regional integration. Andre, before you continue, uh, just, could you just wrap yeah, it up? Yeah, uh, one okay. minute. Uh, and, okay. Yeah, uh, and uh, I, I, um, at the moment, one of the major points I try to elaborate is also uh, the elaboration of set of indicators in order to measure uh, feasibility of the Great Eurasian Partnership. Um, as an integration block. And uh, this is actually the dimension, uh, dimensions and uh, also probably some uh, uh, gorgeous, uh, so uh, some metrics uh, in order to measure this uh, great division partnership. And also, uh, uh, this is uh, of course at the moment uh, is rather um, uh, hypothetic, but uh, at the same time, uh, given the um, SWOT analysis factors, I must say that the basic scenario that uh, this uh, project in current condition is uh, unfeasible and uh, probability actually of this scenario is uh, about 80%. So uh, here's the conclusions I um, must tell actually that uh, this is a really interesting idea of meta regionals and probably uh, in the years to come, there uh, will be some attempts uh, to provide new forms of this meta regionalism. But uh, the uh, question of uh, or issue of feasibility is probably the core one. So, thank you so much. Thank you a lot, Andre. Thank you. And thank you, all the presenters, for your super interesting presentations. So, um, as I said in the beginning, uh, now I'm just going to give some brief comments and uh, add some questions about your presentations. Um, and then after you answer these questions and comments, we can open the floor uh, for the questions from the audience. Okay. So, um, the first thing that I would like to um, say, and I'm not sure if you felt that listening to the all to the presentations is that it's something very puzzling for me because a common trend trend between the three presentations is that when we look at Central Asia or to the big region um, in that in that part of the world that we are seeing a trend of cooperation. David mentioned that that uh, this last phase of relations between China and Russia is a phase of cooperation. Tianyi also mentioned the possibilities of cooperation between China and the EU. And Andre was now uh, telling us about the probability of deepening cooperation between all these, um, all these areas, uh, creating a meta-regionalism type of structure. So the first question that I would have for the three presenters is uh, what explains this? What explains this trend of deepening cooperation between uh, regions or great powers. Because we hear a lot in the news and in many analyses that the trend now is competition. And the pandemic kind of showed that, that there is a lot of competition between, uh, between the countries. But your analysis shows something uh, a bit different. So I would like to ask you what is explaining this uh, deepening of cooperation between countries that you observed in the areas that you are studying. Um, so this is the overall comment about the three uh, presentations. More um, specifically about uh, David's presentation. Um, 
my um, I, I would have uh, a couple of questions, but uh, not to make it very long. I'm just going to ask one. Um, David, could you tell us if there is one factor or other factors that uh, is influencing the transition between the three phases that you told us about? Or if the transition between each of the phases uh, was influenced by different set of factors? So the question would be if there is a factor affecting the transition between the three phases, or if there is a different composition of factors between the phases for forcing its transition. Because my hunch would be that the factor kind of like in the background of all these transitions and all these phases is China. How China positions itself in the world and according to China's relative strength or clear or unclear goals uh, for its international relations, it kind of forces a transition in the relationship with Russia because in a way it would be the, the most powerful partner in that, in that uh, relationship. Um, so that, that, that would be the question that I would have for you. And just one minor, one minor comment. In the beginning, in the first phase that you mentioned, in which there was a kind of a partnership between Russia and China to uh, challenge the US because uh, of the US presence. Um, from what I recall, I remember that China and Russia, at least in the beginning, tried to cooperate with the US because they were all interested in fighting Islamic uh, uh, terrorism or separatism in that region. So um, if you could tell us how they change from trying to cooperate to the US to try to balance the US, that will be also uh, very helpful. So moving to uh, Tiani. Um, Tiani's um, presentation is making a very strong argument because uh, Tiani is telling us that we are entering a new phase of geopolitics. And correct, correct me when, when I'm wrong, okay, Tiani? Um, um, you're suggesting that we are entering a new phase of uh, geopolitics uh, that suggests a different relationship between economics and politics. Um, I would like to push you a little bit on that. And I would like you to tell us a little bit about how is this different between um, the process of a globalization that were led by the US. Because the US also tried to connect politics and economics and with this relationship, even promoting globalization, exert influence in the world. So um, what I would like for you to clarify is that what China is bringing to the table now is a different connection between geopolitics and um, uh, between economics and politics in comparison to the US, so a different nature in this relationship, or what China is bringing is completely new and was never done uh, before, okay? So how new is uh, the Belt and Road when compared to other uh, big projects that we had in the past, for example, conducted by the US? And uh, you were very strong in your argument, suggesting and proposing all the opportunities and the potential in the cooperation between China and the EU. But just to play devil's advocate, because that's my mission here a little bit as well, to play devil's advocate, in the State of Union um, speech that the President of the European Commission gave just uh, this week or last week, uh, she said that China for the EU is a strategic rival. So for the European Commission, at this point, China is more of a rival than a partner. If there are so many reasons to cooperate, as you were saying, why do you think the EU looks at China as a strategic rival and not as a strategic partner? What, what changed uh, so that there was this mindset uh, change in, uh, in the EU. If you could elaborate a little bit on that, that would be very helpful as well. Um, and a last question regards the pandemia. I had to ask this question. It's a classic, sorry, I had to ask this question. Um, 
many countries with the pandemic looking at China, what they said is that now we have to decouple from China. We realize that we are too dependent on imports from China and we have to find a way to start producing things on our own and not importing them from China. So the trend that we saw with the pandemic was countries trying to separate a little bit themselves from China. Do you think this represents a risk to the big project that China is proposing now, the Belt and Road? Do you think that as going forward, we are going to see more competition with countries and China than cooperation as your presentation was suggesting? So that will be my last, last question. Thanks a lot for your presentation as well. So lastly, Andre, um, very bold argument um, as well. Um, my, my question, and um, you gave us a really rich presentation in terms of data and the prospects of success of this project. My question will be, um, and let, let's see if you agree with me or not. So there were projects in history in which countries try to exert influence or try to rule over this really big area. As David was saying in the beginning, Russia tried it before. Uh, the UK also tried it with the, the, the big game or the great game. Um, so this was tried before. Do you think this is the same? Is, is, do you think it's a, yet again another big power trying to find a way to exert its influence over this area? Now, not through imperialism like before, but through institutions, uh, trade agreements, and uh, stuff like this. And if we look at the past, we see that these projects failed. So the British uh, Empire failed, the Russian Empire failed, even the German Empire that tried to get to this region also failed. Do you think that looking at the past, we can get any clues as to uh, the extent that this project can su succeed or not? Is history any help uh, in trying to understand if a project like this uh, has any feasibility? And um, lastly, um, so from what I understood from your presentation, I see this is more an idea than actually um, 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 an operationalized plan. Um, and if we take this great greater Eurasian partnership and as an idea, as, as a discourse proposed by Russia, um, what, what is causing this type of discourse? Why, why is Russia, why is Putin trying to come up with this idea and proposing this discursive tool? Um, do you think that he has any hopes of trying to establish any coherence Lead, led by Russia in this area? Or it's just uh, talk for internal politics saying, look, we are still influential outside and we have these big plans, regardless of if they are feasible um, or not. And last question, and I promise I end here. Um, you included the European Union. And, and again, the relationship between the European Union and Russia is very difficult at this point. Um, how do you see the prospects of cooperation between the EU and Russia within this big framework of the greater Eurasian partnership? Uh, looking at how the relations stand now, should we be hopeful or they are very shaky now and we don't know as we go forward? So I stop my comments here. Um, if you'll be so kind and address them, and then I would move to uh, audience questions. Thank you. Thank you again for your presentations, David. Uh, thank you for the questions and for the comments. I'll start uh, with a general question regarding the factors which might explain the cooperation between great powers. I'll address in this regard the cooperation of which I was talking about between Russia and China. And um, I would say this, can be explained through their commitment towards multilateralism in a stance against the US, which of course uh, manifested also at systemic level, but also at the level of Central Asia in the context of the US intervention there uh, during the beginning of the 21st century. 
And I think that their uh, cooperation enhanced, uh, especially after 2014 and all the criticism and sanctions uh, confronted by Russia for its actions in Eastern Ukraine and the annexation of Crimea. And uh, this is why I think uh, Russia reoriented towards uh, China and uh, their cooperation became even stronger during the last years on this background. Um, regarding the second question, uh, the factors which might influence the transition between the, the stages that I presented. Um, thank you for suggesting the factor of China. I didn't take it into consideration so much until now. I mean, I, the research didn't reach it in a very structured way until now, but I focused more on um, the US for the, for the first period. So as I mentioned, um, what I understood or what I regarded as a diminishing of the US presence in the region after their eviction from Uzbekistan, even though uh, the US still maintained a strong presence through its base in Kyrgyzstan, which was later challenged in 2009. And finally, uh, uh, they left it in 2014, if I'm not wrong. Uh, still, I perceived this uh, eviction from Uzbekistan as uh, diminishing in their presence, which made room for another type of relation to come to the surface, precisely the competition on energy resources. And uh, finally, the, what made the transition to the next period, it indeed, uh, I think it can be connected more with China's rise but I also uh, connected it with the fall, let's say, of Russia in the context of the economic crisis of 2008-2009 when um, its economic power was shaken. And this is also what the, the information that I read about says its trade power with the region, with Central Asia, diminished after the economic crisis while that of China increased. Of course, this can be explained also by, uh, by China's rise and its intent of being more present and have a bigger footprint on the international arena. Um, and uh, the third question was about uh, the relation with the US in the beginning of their intervention and the partnership uh, they had, how they uh, went towards a balancing against the US. Well, indeed, yes. In the first um, moments of their intervention, Russia and China were, um, let's say, satisfied, or it, it was all right for them that the US intervened because, as you said, they, uh, the US was fighting against uh, terrorism. Uh, here is a, a slightly bigger discussion. Ahmed Rashid argues that initially um, Russia was opposing any form of intervention of US in the region, but Uzbekistan uh, started negotiating by itself with, with the US. So um, confronted with a dissident uh, movement in the bloc of Central Asian states, Russia tried to foster this common answer in which uh, they decided let's grant the US the permission to enter the region. And as I said, in the first uh, uh, months, yes, uh, this uh, was suitable for Russia and China because the US was fighting uh, the Taliban regime in the end and uh, extremism. Uh, what Russia and China hoped was that their presence will be temporary in the region. When they defeated the, when the U.S. defeated the Taliban regime, and then expanded their interests and moved forward towards Iraq, and even more, they stayed in the region even more. They prolonged their presence in the Afghanistan and so on. That moment uh, represented this uh, shift that made uh, Russia and China feel threatened by the presence of the U.S. Um, I think uh, this can be also shown 
through their common declarations uh, in the context of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. I, if I'm not wrong, around 2002, when uh, there was a document regarding its establishment uh, issued, it contained some uh, uh, aspects regarding the U.S. presence, condemning their multilateral, their uh, unilateral uh, military presence, and so on. So I think uh, it was pretty quickly uh, understandable for China and Russia that the U.S. might be a threat for them in the region. Mm -hmm. And uh, if I may say, not uh, the military presence was the biggest issue as much as the destabilizing effects it might have through the promotion of norms, even though this was a secondary importance for the US. Yeah. So a fear that the regimes in Central Asia might become uh, oriented towards the West, not uh, being so much tightly connected with Russia or China, this was perceived as another threat. Okay. And all these factors amounted towards a decision to balance against the US through political and military means. Yeah. Well, since you are talking about uh, threats, um, I guess you know his work, uh, Stefan Walt. He has a realist theory in, he, in which he, call, he talks about the balance of threat, not yes. the balance of power, but the balance of threat. Maybe his work might also be helpful uh, for your study because it can add also this idea of threat and how these uh, rearrangements, they can change according to our threat perceptions. Um, just yes, a suggestion. Thank you for the suggestion. Indeed, it might it might be as well. I will consider it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, Tiani. Uh, for the first question, uh, I think China's one built one road has transformed the traditional geopolitical concept uh, that emphasizes sea power and land power into a new geopolitical concept uh, that realizes the mutual interest of all the country because we entered uh, with the civil uh, development of uh, globalization. Uh, now we every country need, is seeking a new road and uh, uh, one built one road is recorded to the ancient Silk Road. It brought a new geopolitical thought and a new geopolitical image. It can expand uh, the uh, international geopolitical uh, span and uh, suit for the modern geopolitical images. And uh, as uh, China is developing, and uh, uh, you see uh, many countries seek maybe China will be a new competitor instead of a cooperator. I think uh, uh, Chinese one built and one road is not only the central country is not only China. Uh, every country um, develop their advantages with their own new character. And um, in the one built one road uh, initiative uh, as the country uh, of European Union, Italy. Italy is also a center of this uh, uh, 21st uh, Maritime Road. So uh, many countries like uh, European Union, uh, Russia, also America is um, actively attended uh, to this road and pay a lot of attention because every country has its own advantage and they can take um, an important role in the, we can see it's a ma majority of, uh, it, it is a cooperation road instead of a competition road because China try, is trying to, um, to do the best uh, common construction, common uh, communication and uh, common share. This is the main principle of the one belt, one, one road. And um, uh, for the third question, uh, whether there is more uh, co cooperation in the one built one road or this road, uh, we, uh, other country will get rid of uh, this uh, more depend on China. Uh, in my view, as a Chinese people, I don't think uh, 
as a country is dependent on China because there are a lot of product in China from all over the world, from Europe, from America. And the main problem why Chinese, China's government is seeking for a new road to explore uh, some new cooperation with other country because uh, as uh, um, in introductory country of the world, the most money is not earned by China. We we like uh, industri industrial country. We uh, contribute uh, um, human resource. We contribute uh, uh, substantial resource. It uh, brings some problem like uh, uh, pollution, and um, uh, we cannot earn the. The most uh, money from uh, uh, commerce and trade, we are just uh, like uh, uh, an industrial country. So uh, with the One Belt One Road, uh, China is not only to break the doubt about Western country. To we can make the world learn China more because uh, from the China's development. Many country is adopt uh, is adopt uh, in the Ch Chinese government uh, target. Uh, many uh, think tank uh, give out uh, gives out a lot of uh, question for Chinese uh, belt and road. They think China want to occupy some. Uh, uh, for example, in Italy. Many uh, Italy researchers think uh, China has cooperation with Italy. It's because China want to occupy the part of uh, Italian uh, North to expand uh, all uh, Chinese product to all over the world. But uh, uh, from the from the ancient Silk Road, there is a road from China to the Europe. It's not only it's not a road uh, Chinese government uh, put out uh, there um, thousand years ago. There is a road uh, from uh, uh, east to west. We just uh, do a new proportion to to make more uh, cooperation for the other country. And uh, we all can. Well, uh, this road is not. Only built from Chinese government because all the country is facing like economic crisis. All the country is want to seek a new route to develop their own country's benefit and develop uh, to improve the, uh, their country's uh, public um, life uh, life level. So um, I think. Uh, the belt and the road will bring more cooperation instead of uh, European countries want to get out of uh, relations of China. Okay, thank you. I understood. So you're you're saying that there is so much interdependence between these economies that it's very unlikely there will be decoupling or the decrease of globalization. Yes, because China is the third biggest country in the world. It mm -hmm. is not possible no connection or because the territory is uh, defining the uh, co cooperation relation with other country. So if China is a small country, maybe they can get mm -hmm. rid of China. China is uh, the third biggest country. It's a nature thing, uh, um, except uh, all, and, and if we don't put the one belt, one road, uh, we uh, other country will have other cooperation, other relations with uh, China. It's, yeah. uh, Good point, Yanui. Good point. Thank um, you. Okay, thank you. Uh, we can move now to Andre. Yes. Um, first, concerning your general question, uh, why are the process of uh, regional integration are so active uh, within the Eurasian continent at the moment? Uh, from perspective, uh, the reason is actually um, uh, the bunch of uh, different factors from different uh, level and from different nature. I mean, not only economic, but also uh, geopolitical factors uh, and uh, also 
um, we must take into account the processes which are underway at the moment, uh, not only on the macro level, I mean, uh, the competition between different powers like uh, China and the United States, that is actually the reason why uh, the project of Belt and Road is underway. Uh, one of the uh, hypotheses uh, at the moment is actually that uh, the decision of the United States to um, infringe uh, the activity of China in uh, um, uh, South Sea uh, was the reason why actually China decided to uh, build this uh, uh, land corridors and first of all uh, Belt and Road. Uh, we take uh, the post-Soviet uh, space, this is a different story, I think. Uh, uh, the regional integration is stipulated by, uh, first of all, uh, the activity of uh, extra, extra regional uh, actors like United States uh, or uh, European Union or China, but also uh, the inner you know, factors like uh, the desire of Russia not to lose its uh, influence uh, on uh, the po former post-Soviet Republic. So uh, it's, um, for instance, Central Asia is traditionally regarded uh, in Russia as a, something like backyard and uh, the sphere of influence. And uh, if we see actually the activity of China um, uh, going forward with these uh, initiatives like uh, Belt and Road initiatives, uh, this is actually, uh, situation when you are losing the um, souls and hearts of uh, uh, your um, formerly uh, formerly sister republics uh, sister republic this was actually the notion for the soviet mm -hmm. republics uh, uh, in the soviet union so um, my um, answer is actually we see here uh, different so mix of factors uh, in the genius in the genius and uh, also uh, from different nation, different uh, essence. And uh, 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 from my perspective, uh, uh, what we see, for, for instance, uh, between Russia and China, and uh, more generally between uh, Russian uh, integration project and uh, Chinese integration project, this is actually the uh, desire not to compete and desire not to be rivals, but try to find something like a common grounds uh, for uh, uh, further development. But I'm really uh, dubious actually that uh, there will be no competition between uh, Russia and China concerning, for instance, this area of uh, Central Asia, uh, because uh, from the history we know uh, that uh, if uh, we are, there are two bears in one den, uh, actually, it, it, it always um, actually uh, this is all. Uh, it is always uh, the issue of uh, competition, and this is uh, this corresponds with the third uh, question concerning the interrelation between uh, Russia and China, uh, Russia and the EU. I'm sorry. Uh, if we take uh, um, uh, the situation uh, currently, uh, the um, relations are semi-frozen. Mm -hmm. So uh, on the political uh, level, there are no contacts, but uh, if we take, for instance, uh, humanitarian uh, sector, uh, the con contacts are really active. Uh, for instance, uh, I don't know, um, Erasmus project is really active in Russia. Uh, but uh, if we take um, Russia and uh, the European Union as regional players, uh, this is uh, the huge competence between uh, these two players. Uh, and uh, uh, there is uh, even uh, the notion, so-called contested neighborhood. This is uh, the former Soviet republics. Uh, many of them are the members of so-called uh, Eastern Partnership Program uh, uh, from, of the European Union, uh, which are actually uh, the objects of this influence uh, by Russia and by the European Union. Uh, but uh, here we see uh, the sheer competition. And uh, one of, uh, actually one of them by my publication uh, is uh, Eurasian Economic Union, European integration needs. Uh, raising means actually which integration blocks actually try to move uh, um, from this uh, um, contested neighborhood. Um, Back to your questions, uh, probably I, I to answer the uh, uh, question concerning uh, this specific question. First of all, um, 
about uh, the projects in history, and this is the same thing, actually, this is, uh, I don't think that uh, Great Eurasian um, Partnership is something like an imperial project, no. Uh, the project, uh, and uh, probably you are right, than the project, uh, or, or there is something like a socialization of a between European Economic Union, a Belt and Road Initiative, but at the moment, this is more idea than the project. Uh, so I think this is uh, the um, just to put forward uh, something like um, um, uh, something like um, some, um, probably some um, kind of uh, initiative uh, which try um, evade this competition. Uh, in the future between uh, Russia and uh, China concerning, uh, for instance, uh, Central Asian region. So the idea, we try to uh, uh, provide connectivity, try to connect different integration blocks. Uh, probably there are um, more pluses than minuses and uh, we uh, uh, see in the future how it goes. Uh, and we not only try to uh, create this on the bilateral level, also to create uh, um, on a multilateral uh, level. The question is uh, concerning this great partnership, uh, whether it's feasible or not, not because uh, uh, there is competition uh, at the moment in the latent, latent phase between Russia and China, for instance, but uh, unwillingness, for instance, of the European Union to become uh, the partner and, uh, of this project, so on. Do uh, not only to the current interrelations between uh, European Union uh, and Russia, but also, and uh, I must stress this thing, uh, and values between, uh, if we take uh, Russia, European Union, China. So this is also uh, the, probably the answer to the question you asked uh, Tiani about why European Union is so um, uh, so anxious uh, about uh, the Chinese influence. Uh, one of the point is that uh, the European Union is anxious because of this uh, soft Chinese soft power, uh, which uh, has also one of the, uh, this element of uh, authoritarian rule and something like this. This is uh, different political values if you take this. Uh, and um, I don't think actually uh, this is a you know, great Eurasia partnership uh, is imperial uh, project. Uh, this is idea which is not uh, fully full fledged and I'm uh, not really optimistic that it goes as a project. Uh, but this is uh, uh, their attempt actually to create something like a structure uh, when we try to um, um, when we try actually to uh, uh, get all the benefits and try to exclude the conflict of interests. Mm -hmm. But this is actually a really uh, a difficult point. Uh, uh, I told you about the interrelation between Russia and the EU, but uh, for instance, there is also a different story about interrelations of China and ASEAN uh, countries. Many of them are also anxious about the Chinese influence and there are uh, even uh, some um, military or um, semi-military uh, conflict between, for instance, China and Vietnam concerning these islands and uh, uh, Yellow Sea and uh, um, South Chinese uh, Sea and something like this. So uh, this uh, was the first question. And the second one, uh, uh, idea, um, well, I think actually um, this uh, Great Eurasian Partnership is not uh, a topic of uh, inner agenda in Russia mm -hmm. uh, because, uh, you know, um, uh, other uh, episodes like Ukraine, uh, like, uh, for instance, uh, also cooperation with China. I think this is uh, the idea uh, just uh, uh, to keep up with Chinese uh, integration, uh, the initiatives, and also to promote some uh, um, ideas, uh, which can be not uh, substitutes, but something like uh, um, um, projects which try to uh, um, uh, 
probably to appease different integration uh, integration uh, strategies and different integration projects. This is my perspective. Uh, the third question about this interrelation between um, Russia and the EU, I have already mentioned. So probably if you have uh, more questions, you are welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. Um, yeah, um, I, I really like uh, the stress that you put on this idea of different political values and soft power and how these influences alignments between the great powers. I think that's um, a very interesting topic. And um, I guess that's something that we should look at. That's, uh, that's a really good point as well. Um, okay, we still have um, more or less 15 minutes until the end of the session. So I would like to ask the audience if you have uh, any questions. Um, if you have any questions, just raise your hand as Andrew is, is doing, or just put the question on the chat or raise your hand in the participant section and then I can ask you to pose the question. Andrew, your question, please. Try to be brief and direct, okay, to help the speakers. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you for a most informative and enlightening panel and very well chaired. Um, I'd like to throw in um, a few uh, dimensions not uh, touched upon uh, in, the, in terms of um, Russian-China relationship. Now, this big um, kind of challenge from the United States, which is trying to contain China and also confront uh, China and also contain uh, the Russian influence, and actually energizes and um, uh, the, the cooperation between these two partner uh, countries and have overridden uh, the kind of hidden um, uh, competition between Russia and China. Because there is in fact some competition uh, between these two countries in terms of influence uh, in the um, uh, Central, Asia, Central Asia and also in Eurasian countries. Uh, don't forget that of course, as far as energy is concerned, uh, China is the biggest customer in the world. And then even you've got oil and gas, I mean, you need the biggest customer for your market. But in a mar rather than uh, kind of uh, investment and trade, uh, the competition is of course not only influence because there is also a hidden thing which is seldom mentioned uh, in Russia uh, because uh, look at the huge um, territory of Russia. Uh, a large part of Siberia, I would say about half, was seized from uh, China during the Qing Dynasty, during the, uh, the, um, 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 the, the, the Tsar, um, I think it was Catherine the Great and, and, and that area. And then, of course, the large part of that is very scarcely populated. And then there are more and more Chinese moving to that. And there is also uh, always a hidden fear. Uh, that um, maybe in about two decades or half a century, China can do a Crimea kind of referendum uh, on Russia. Now, this is seldom mentioned, but I think that this is rather uh, true uh, if you look at the dynamics. So that's one, one question. The other uh, um, uh, question about the Bell and Road, um, I think there is a great deal of worry um, in, the in the European Union and other countries. Of course, the United States has called the Bell and Road a constricting belt and a road to uh, and, and, and a one-way road only to China. Uh, but then uh, this is rhetoric, of course, this is a United States rhetoric. But in the, in the European Union, the worry is that um, the Bell and Road has created a kind of indebtedness, um, the, uh, the, the typical uh, poster child uh, of this uh, criticism, of course, is in the port in Sri Lanka, which has now been uh, given away uh, or, or, or leased for 100 years, just like Hong Kong, uh, to China. There's a smack of colonialism. The other thing is that, of course, there is a lack of transparency, um, apart from the very well, um, the point already made by our colleagues here in this panel, uh, that China is spreading the influence and China coming from um, um, uh, what is perceived to be an authoritarian regime uh, with an alien civilization at, at odds uh, with um, a liberal order led by the United States. So that, I think that's the, the point about the Ben Rook. Lastly, um, the kind of um, greater Eurasia, um, one point which hasn't been touched upon is the, um, the earlier theory, I think it was by Nicholas Spikeman uh, in, the, in 1983 to 1943, uh, about the kind of rimland theory, uh, the kind of continental powers. And now you can see the huge um, uh, expanse uh, of the greater uh, Eurasia. Um, and the connectivity between these countries are really um, within a huge continent. 
And then this, of course, is challenge uh, the kind of traditional maritime powers. Uh, the United States is uh, actually separated by two oceans, uh, and the, of course, the 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 the, uh, the uh, uh, former uh, European powers are really maritime powers. So are we seeing the emergence of now a continental uh, kind of power block challenging uh, what is traditionally Western maritime uh, kind of uh, power inputs? Well, here I stop. I mean, there's sufficient <laughs> material. Thank you. The... Thank you, Andrew. Thank you a lot for your questions. I have uh, a raised hand here. Um, I'm not sure if I'm going to pronounce your name rightly. Gulsen? Gulsen Aydin? Gulsen. Gulsen Aydin. Gu Gulsen. I'm so sorry, Gulsen. Gulsen, go ahead. Your question. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Uh, I want to ask my question to Andre. Um, Andre, you mentioned uh, European Union within the framework of uh, meso-regionalism. Uh, I can't figure out why it's all uh, supranational institution structure, uh, why European Union is uh, involved in uh, meso-regionalism instead of macro-regionalism. Thank you, Gulshan. Thank you for your question. One last question for this round. Please, sir, you raise your head. Go ahead. Yeah. The microphone. Yeah, you can switch on the microphone. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my question is the maybe all of the panelists. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, as you know that there are frozen conflict in post-Soviet space, uh, and we know that Belarus and Minsk, uh, there are some uh, incidents, maybe it become another frozen conflict area in the future, like Ukraine and Georgia and other frozen conflict. Uh, my question is, what do you think about the frozen conflict's effects on the Belt and Road Initiative and Greater Eura Eurasian Partnership? Um, is there, uh, what, what, are the, what are the frozen conflict's uh, future effect uh, or current effect on the this both uh, Belt Road and Shilavan Greater Eurasian Partnership. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so we have to wrap, wrap up the questions here. I'm going to move to the panelists now, to the speakers, to address the questions. We have less than 10 minutes until the end of the session, so I'm going to ask you to be brief in your answers, if you could, okay? Uh, I guess we can start now the other way around with Andre, if you don't mind. Andre, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, first, I um, ask the question of Dulshen. Thank you so much for your question. Concerning the uh, European Union, uh, if we take uh, European Union, uh, uh, well, first of all, this uh, differ differentiation uh, is made on this spatial ground. So if we take European Union, it's all only a European region, European continent. If we take uh, uh, Commonwealth of Independent States, which encompass the former Soviet republics, uh, which are not only uh, the European nation, but also uh, some nations uh, in Central Asia and Asia. This is actually uh, more, uh, I would say, uh, Commonwealth of Independent States more special uh, than the European Union. That's why uh, um, I put it uh, uh, in this uh, group of uh, um, uh, meso uh, regionalism. If we take uh, actually uh, European Union, um, probably I ask your question. Or uh, do you have some second thoughts concerning this about uh, the the question about the frozen conflicts uh, in uh, Eur um, Eurasian continent? Uh, this is a, a really good point and a really good issue due to the fact. But uh, this. Uh, Uh, partnership uh, um, um, put into special cooperation actually the connectivity between different uh, uh, integration blocks uh, and I have already mentioned about this uh, situation uh, between China and ASEAN uh, countries uh, but uh, for me uh, a really uh, point is actually how it goes further for instance uh, with uh, uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization after this um, conflict uh, on the boundary between India and China. Whether uh, actually it will put some influence on uh, further um, 
activity integration activity within this um, uh, between within this project, but generally speaking, uh, there are so many embedded conflicts and so many uh, uh, so many um, uh, uh, burning points between uh, the nations uh, that uh, for me and I have already stressed this. I'm not really optimistic about this uh, great Eurasian partnership. One of the uh, point is that uh, Greater Eurasian Partnership uh, is uh, has this embedded con uh, conflicts of interest and it's really conflicts and uh, nobody knows how it goes further. Uh, this is uh, that's why uh, if I, I'm trying to ask you a question, um, I think that th this. Uh, long-lasting conflict will be the factor uh, which actually uh, make the creation of or, or probably uh, facilitation of uh, or carrying out of this uh, project of Eurasian, a great Eurasian partnership is really complicated. Uh, but uh, if we take uh, the current agenda, for instance, uh, really interesting, uh, you mentioned Belarus, uh, the situation in Belarus. Uh, this is uh, uh, really interesting because, uh, well, I um, was reading lots of information about the attitude of uh, uh, the Belarusian uh, opposition towards uh, the Eurasian Economic Union uh, because um, one of the points why actually uh, Russia supported Lukashenko, uh, and this is this was made actually, uh, he was uh, um, he was uh, praised by Vladimir Putin as the uh, newly elected president of Belarus. That was uh, 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 the fear that probably the Belarusian opposition um, makes uh, the turn to the West and uh, there will be some uh, setbacks for uh, the uh, um, integration structures like Eurasian Economic Union. Uh, moreover, uh, Belarus and Russia has uh, one more integration uh, structure, so-called uh, the joint uh, state between Russia and Belarus. And uh, this is uh, r really interesting, but uh, if we take uh, this rationally, uh, at the moment, the Belarus economy is mainly connected to the Russian one. Uh, so about 70% of all the of experts of Belarus goes to Russia and to Eurasian Economic Union. Trey, you and, have to wrap up, okay? Yeah. Otherwise, sorry. we don't have time for the others. Well, probably, uh, well, I ask, try to ask all the questions. Uh, sorry for taking too much time. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Very briefly, Tiani. Okay. Um, for for the Belt and Road, um, um, I think the conflict uh, we we met with uh, America is uh, major because uh, this road is challenging the Americas uh, um, in global global how to say global controllers role. But uh, um, this when Belt Road is. Uh, contained the geopolitical uh, image uh, to it depends on the country and the uh, culture uh, cultural difference and uh, we are trying to don't influence other countries uh, uh, self development uh, method and uh, self develop uh, choice um, and it's it's a doubt for us, for us that um, also for the Chinese government, it's a big challenge to uh, face all the country's uh, uh, environment and uh, their own conflict. It's uh, the uh, urban area of uh, Europe. The, their country has their own, own uh, different uh, problems uh, and um, uh, and also some uh, zone of uh, Europe has their own, own problem of country. Uh, it's a little bit challenge for China to uh, deal with all the country's uh, uh, problem. But um, um, as America hope uh, use the um, our Afghan as the central part to integrate uh, uh, Central Asia and South Asia, you, uh, Russia, 
want to integrate uh, the pre-souvenir area. Uh, China's One Belt One Road hopes to uh, integrate uh, from uh, east to and uh, west, uh, integrate um, all the Europe uh, island uh, and to reduce the um, difference, make uh, the um, a Central Asia countries uh, to believe our uh, this road is uh, the main operation is uh, the cooperation to uh, release the um, worries about uh, other countries. And um, we can see the Belt One Road is a Taiji uh, geopolitical image to support the um, questions. Uh, so it uh, is a road with uh, full of Chinese character, but I think um, uh, every country could uh, uh, seek the common place and the, the cooperation point from uh, this road. And uh, um, some difficulties and challenges we cannot uh, get rid of. And uh, you have to rip up as well. You have to finish so that uh, okay. we still has some time, okay? Okay, sorry. Uh, so um, the, the meaning to uh, this road is to uh, reduce the um, conflict of the world and try to get more uh, peaceful and cooperation for bringing to the world. Thank you. Thank you, Tiani. David, very briefly as well. Thank oh, you. Yes, thank you. I'll just have a few brief comments upon the Belt and Road and the uh, Called the conflict or the frozen conflicts. I'd like to say that my personal view is that it won't influence too much the evolution of the frozen conflicts, the Belt and Road uh, development, since uh, I think, in my perspective, that Russia is needed more. Russia's actions are is need are needed more towards solving these conflicts than those of China. And uh, one uh, possible development that I might think of. Uh, through the interdependence that the Belt and Road might create, this might limit the future development or the future emergence of other frozen or other conflicts which might become frozen. And uh, regarding the tensions uh, and the competition in Central Asia between Russia and China, uh, yes, uh, it is. I'm not excluding it. Uh, but at the same time, as I mentioned earlier, I think it is rather contained uh, because the efforts of the two states are also coordinated on different fields of action. China more on the economic field, while Russia more on the security uh, field. Of course, the latest developments show that China starts also involving in the security field with that base in Tajikistan, for example. But uh, this might prove useful for further research. Mm -hmm. But until this point, I would say that so far they more or less coordinated. Of course, still existing uh, competition dimension between them. But this coordination, uh, if not uh, official, but it is, uh, implies also a certain degree of cooperation. Um, but yes, in other areas, the competition between them uh, can uh, become very high, like in Se Siberia, the Far East, uh, or other other regions. Thank you. Thank you, David. And I guess we can conclude our panel now. I would like to thank you all for your presentations. I think, and I hope you agree, this was an extremely interesting panel. Thank you to the presenters. Thank you also to the questions from the audience. They made the panel better. Um, and I wish you all the continuation of a good conference. I hope you keep enjoying the conference. And in that end, I would like to invite you to follow the next panel that is going to discuss the impacts of COVID-19 on the greater Eurasia. If you're interested, I invite you to go to that panel as well. Once again, thank you very much for your presentations. And I hope to see you all very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye.